Hello and welcome to the International Leadership Association's Leadership Perspectives webinar for August 2010. This webinar, entitled Still Surprised, A Life in Leadership, is the occasion to celebrate Warren Bennis's recently published, published memoir. This webinar will begin with a conversation between Warren Bennis and Jean Litman Blumen, followed by Q&A from the audience. Before we proceed, please note the following. First, this webinar will be archived. If you miss something, would like to hear the webinar again, or would like to see the presentation again, the recording and the presentation will be published to the ILA website within 24 hours of this event. You will receive an email with instructions for accessing the archived recording after the webinar has ended. Second, we welcome your questions throughout the webinar. At any time, you may ask questions by typing them into the questions box of your webinar control panel, which is currently displayed on the right-hand side of your screen. Third, should you wish to purchase Still Surprised for yourself, we are pleased to announce that participants in this webinar may do so at a special discounted rate. Instructions for purchasing the book at this special rate will be emailed to you following this event. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jean Lippmann Blumen. Dr. Jean Lippmann Blumen is the Thornton F. Bradshaw Professor of Public Policy and Professor of Organizational Behavior at the Peter F. Drucker Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Management at the Claremont Graduate University, where she also serves as the co-founding director of the Institute for Advanced Studies in Leadership. She is a board member of several leadership-oriented nonprofit organizations as an, and is an emerita board member of the International Leadership Association. In October 2010, Professor Jean Lippmann Blumen will receive a Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Leadership Association. Jean? Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Warren. Uh, Thank you. Today it is both my overwhelming pleasure and a ridiculously redundant charge to introduce to the webinar audience someone who needs absolutely no introduction. I feel as if I'm, um, I'm introducing Barack Obama and everybody already knows and they're whispering why is she doing this. But let me, <laughs> let me go ahead anyhow. Well, go on, Jean Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Warren, as <clears throat> I think most of you know, is university professor and distinguished professor of business administration at USC. Uh, for those of you, I realize we have people here from many different countries. USC, that's its affectionate name. That's the University of Southern California. And he's founding chairman of the Leadership Institute at USC. Um, he is I think most of you would agree, one of the world's foremost experts on leadership, and he's written more than 30 books and countless articles. So this is the last, in a, in a, at least for the moment, in a very long list of distinguished books. Um, his book, Leaders, was uh, designated by the Financial Times as one of the top business books of all time and he received a Pulitzer Prize nomination for An Invented Life. Um, his best-selling book on becoming a leader, which was republished in 2009 on its 20th anniversary, has been named one of the 100 best business books of all time and considered the top leadership book, I think, by many. Um, but let me uh, advise you that Warren is not simply an armchair theorist. He is not someone who is content to count how many angels dance on the head of a pin. <clears throat> he, has, uh, he has undertaken serious and significant leadership positions, so he knows whereof he speaks. Prior to uh, coming to USC, Warren spent 11 years as a uh, university administrator, first as provost at SUNY Buffalo, and then as president of the University of Cincinnati. And we will talk about those adventures, because I think they really were adventures, Warren. Mm -hmm. And he has consulted to many 
uh, Fortune 500 companies uh, to presidents of the United States and uh, other international leaders. And I could spend the whole the whole webinar talking about you, Warren, but I refuse, totally refuse. So I think w with that having been said, uh, let's turn to the book, Still Surprised, A Memoir of a Life in Leadership. I found this a very exciting journey myself to follow your journey, your life's journey. And Warren, as you know and as I've said to you, part I had special interest in this because uh, I it came some years after you to Sockrell and my husband Hal Levitt was somebody who was in many of these places, MIT and Bethel, uh, either before or concurrently with you. Mm -hmm. So I know about those places and this is another view peeking into you know, a very exciting, dramatic time in, in history, I think. Um, the major focus today <clears throat> will be on Warren's latest book, which is called Still Surprised, A Memoir of a Life in Leadership. And, <clears throat> of course, we can explore other waters, uh, particularly when we get to the Q&A period and the audience has an opportunity to uh, ask its questions. But I'd like to begin by exploring several explicit themes that create the armature of this very intriguing book entitled Still Surprise. And I'm going to pair these themes and then sort of link the pairs. And I may not come back to them in the order I talk about them right now. <clears throat> but I saw at least four pairs and then one sort of solo theme that I thought was very interesting. I mean, if we could talk about this book for a week. So there has to be a sort of a a shortcut, as it were, for us to get our arms around it. And I'm trying to do this by articulating some of the important themes. The first pair of themes, Warren and dear audience, uh, talks about relinquishing roles and relationships and reinventing yourself. That's the first pair. The second pair is surprise and luck. The third pair, as far as I could see, was the desire <clears throat> to be at the center of exciting events, to wrestle with big ideas, and the other half of that set is optimism and hope for the future, encased in profound personal, curi personal and intellectual curiosity. And the fourth pair is mentors and friends. And the fifth theme that I thought was a very powerful theme in the book was the role of crisis. So there is also, if that were not enough to keep you intrigued, <clears throat> there's a subtext of courage, your personal courage and determination that runs throughout the book. Uh, and I hope we'll save enough time to examine that. But let's take these themes mostly in sets. And I should say I have several questions for about each of these connected themes. So Warren, are you ready? Yes, I am, Jean. <laughs> OK, good. And but I do, not, I do not have a million dollars to present you for the right answers. <laughs> OK. OK, right. <laughs> All right. I'd like to begin by uh, asking you to think about the theme of relinquishing roles and relationships on the one hand mm -hmm. and reinventing yourself on the other. Mm -hmm. uh, several times, beginning really in your childhood or your nascent adolescence, you decide that you want to, and this is your phrase, <clears throat> to orphan yourself from your family. Mm -hmm. That's, I found that an astonishing and courageous thing to think and do, particularly mm -hmm. for someone that young. Most of us want to cling to our roots, despite the novelist Thomas Wolfe's 
admonition that you can't go home again. But you, however, seem to know at an early age that you didn't want to stay at home, much less go home again. And here's, here are my questions on that. What made you decide that? And how did you know that you wanted to move out of that family and be someone else so early on? And where did you get the courage and determination to implement that unusual longing and cling so resolutely to that position through your whole life. Mm. Okay, so what <clears throat> made you decide that? And how what? did you, what made you decide so early on that you wanted to orphan yourself from your family and move out and become a different person? And how did you know that so early on? And where did you get the courage to do it? Mm -hmm. I think if I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't have the courage. But first of all, Jean, I want to thank you for doing this, for taking the time. And also, those, those, the themes that you just articulated were refreshing to me, even though they are the things that you, you, you summarize the major themes of the book so beautifully. And I want to thank you for that. It took a lot of real thought on your part about I never would have thought about it as relinquishing, but you're right. Now, I can just try to respond to that as briefly as I can, given our, our own limits of time. You know, John Barth, a not very well-known novelist, but somebody I knew, got to know at Buffalo, but widely regarded when he was at his prime, John Barth, once said, <clears throat> the story of your life is your story not your life. So when I reconstruct what I'm going to now talk about, it's my story. And, you know, it, I can't claim it's uh, any objective reality about it. But here's what I would pin it to, to be specific. <clears throat> In When I was seven years of age, uh, my dad was working, I, I didn't even know what it was, but it was called a shipping clerk. And he came home one late afternoon and told the family that he'd just been fired. Fired in, 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 so abruptly, so arbitrarily, out of work. This is 1932. I was seven. It was probably at the very, very bottom of the, of the depression. Uh, and I felt he and my whole family and it's like blaming them. I don't want to do that, although it could even sound like that. Uh, I, I, he, he felt so helpless. And the family, and my mother and my older brothers, who are twins, ten, almost 10 years older than I, all looked so, so frightened, and for good reason. And it made me feel I never want ever to feel that uh, helpless. I never want to feel at the effect of somebody who could just terminate my income for the next three or four years. And remember, this was still prohibition. It wasn't repealed until almost the end of 1933. Uh, my dad, how did he get food on the table? Well, he, he loaded illegal cases of booze on mafiosos' trucks. He ran, <laughs> he ran summonses for lawyers. He gave out street money before people went to the election booth to, you know, to vote the ticket, whatever the ticket was. But this was not an unusual story. What's, what may be a little unusual about it is I wanted not to be, I felt that my family exhibited such a despair and helplessness and I dissociated myself from that. Now, it sounds like I'm putting blame on them. I'm not. I'm just saying my reaction to that is I never want to feel that dependent on anybody. And Jean, not to be funny about it, but it is interesting that with all the things I've done in my career, that I ended up in a tenured I position. would think I was about <laughs> to say that. I was were saying, you? Warren, yeah. I was thinking, Warren, is yeah. that where you got the idea you needed a tenured job? Yeah, so <laughs> what, what, could be, what could be safer 
yeah. you know, in a right. way, what could be more, where, where could I be least vulnerable? And the interesting thing about it is, though, I really feel good looking back about doing, I think, some very courageous things. I never thought of myself as being courageous. You know, I, I for example, I never broke out on my own and started my own thing. There are a lot of people listening to this, our, to the, our webinar, Gene. I know several of them who I won't name, but who really have created their own institutions. But I, you know, in one way I played it safe, but another way I did some extraordinarily, in retrospect, I would call stupid things. For example, why did I uh, apply for infantry OC officer candidate school, knowing full well that the average tenure of a platoon infantry officer in combat before wound, before being seriously wounded or killed, was something between six weeks to two months, through, or two, two and a half months. Why did I do, do a thing like that? And yet frightened as I could be about, okay, so relinquishing roles, yes, as part of that family, but the other thing, Jean. But the other part was reinventing yourself. It right. seems to me that your ability to relinquish roles and relationships allowed you to right. reinvent yourself. Well, part of that has to do with the fact that unlike a lot of my friends, colleagues, <clears throat> I right, am dealing with parents who could have been terrific or not. It was as if I emptied myself of, of all those the figures of identification that usually exist in the family. So I grew up trying on roles as if they were clothes, like an actor almost. I am about to get to that point too, yeah. because I think that you started on a journey by joining the army and becoming mm -hmm. at age 19 the youngest officer in the European theater of operations, where you arrived during, I understand, the very last stages of the Battle mm -hmm. of the Bulge, and mm -hmm. you describe how ill-prepared you felt with the role, and I want to emphasize role of leader, yeah. but that by donning your officer's uniform, and you talk about this, how that transformed you, that you began to play the part of the leader. So I, my question is, would it be correct to say that you take a very sociological view of leadership as a performance of a role with a literal or figurative uniform Mm -hmm. that signals your legitimacy, mm -hmm. for one, and two, entitles the actor to certain rights and responsibilities, and three, creates a set of expectations in individuals in counter roles as well as in people observing you. How did this work? What did okay. you draw upon to leave mm -hmm. people so much more experienced and older than you were? Mm -hmm. Boy, we could we could really spend not just the rest of the, our time before we get open to questions, but this is this is a kind of a converse, conversation that could really take days. But I want to make one, one, one or two key points. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, <clears throat> you and I grew up in our um, education uh, as getting doctorates in social psych and social and you in sociology. And yes, one of the interesting themes of the book, which you know and understand perhaps as well as anybody, is I put a lot of emphasis on the effect of role. Not, mm -hmm. not so much as most biographies or autobiographies or memoirs put a lot of emphasis, rightly so, on the nuclear family and the socialization process in the family. And, and I think that's all well and good. God knows I've written a lot about the significance of early family and all that. But I think in general, role is underplayed. And I, I don't want to give the impression that it's like an actor simply trying on, uh, putting on Cyrano's nose and suddenly Olivier becomes Cyrano. Because Olivier, as an example, felt that the costume could, is what you needed to play a role. It's partly that, yes, it's partly those gold bars, it's partly the epaulets, it's partly all the drama that goes with the role, but it's, it's Habermas's, the philosophers, I don't have to put it in fancy terms, 
we have so many possible selves within us, mm -hmm. and occasionally, life pulls out of us uh, those uh, behaviors which we didn't know we were capable of. Yes. All those possible selves, and suddenly you 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 you, 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 you put on a uniform, and it suddenly feels. Gee, how do I become an, an officer? Stanley, uh, Sidney Pollack, the great director and also a good actor, said when he first began directing, he didn't know. All he knew was his mentor, Sandy Meisner, uh, he, he sort of put on, you know, boots, made him put on a cap. He said if there was a, there were a megaphone on, but we try on different things. And sometimes they're, what shall I say, congruent with those parts of our character, sometimes we could put on roles that are phony, that is, they're not part of that composite of, of roles or selves that we're all capable of. It just gets so very, I make, I'm making it more complicated than it should be, because what I'm saying is that we have so many possibilities within us, and I felt empty of knowing being these. All I did was dissociate myself and kept seeking those from whom I could learn and be if they were congruent. I wasn't Doug McGregor, and I stopped trying to be him by growing a mustache and smoking a pipe, but there were pieces of me that Doug drew out of me that, that life was willing to pull out of me, and I think that's true of all of us, Gene. And it isn't, but sometimes, and I, and I keep, let me think of it a counterexample. It's, it's someone I admire and respect and, and I'm a friend of, and that's Al Gore. I think Al Gore, was a hostage of his parents' dreams for what he should be, mm -hmm. that is, President of the United States. I don't think the, that life was pulling out of him the Al Gore that we know today, who's won a Nobel Peace Prize, who's film won a, the Academy Award, Inconvenient. That's the Al Gore that life pulled out of him that was authentic, that was part of him, but he didn't know that. He thought he should be president, and that's what he grew up being. Well, that's where you get phoniness and inauthenticity. I think I, I was able, I knew, for example, to give you another example about relinquishing and inventing myself, I became a university president, and after seven years of doing this, I, not that I, I learned so much, and I'm so glad I did it, but that is not my my calling or my what I would call the basic. If there is a basic character in me called Warren Bennis, that is the the, the real thing. I thought, oh no, uh, I learned a lot, but I, I never felt I loved it. I never felt it was it was too much of of adapting to a particular set of expectations called role that I didn't want to continue my life doing. I hope I'm, it's a very, it's, it, you're putting your finger with your first you know, set of distinct, you're pairing things about relinquishing mm -hmm. and inventing. Probably that's the heart of the book in a way, theoretically, conceptually, and in reality. Because well, I think it traces the arc of your your life. And you've had a very exciting and illustrious life. And during that, you've repeatedly, not just once, but repeatedly relinquished roles and relationships in order to. And let me, and, and I think that was not necessarily a conscious thing, mm -hmm. in order to reinvent yourself and discover new ideas and new challenges and new people. For example, mm -hmm. it seems to me, and I'm going to ask you to comment on this, that you first gave up your family and you moved into the army. Then you gave that up and went to Antioch. And you mm -hmm. give up each of these roles and relationships, it seems to me, not necessarily when they become uncomfortable, but almost when you seem to outgrow them or you see something out there that's more exciting. And then you go to Antioch, from there you go to MIT, from there you go, and there are places in between, but the University of Buffalo, the University of Cincinnati, a houseboat in Sausalito where you spent a year, mm -hmm. and then again, I think a time of uh, personal, intellectual, cognitive 
ferment and then on to USC. Um, do you feel that, you know, one, I want to ask you, you've commented on some of the things you've learned along the way. Are there other things you learned along the way? And do you feel you lost anything important mm -hmm. along no. the way? You know, Jean, I want to tell you something. Conversation. Conversation is how I learn. I, I just got an insight just now with your question. So Good. I may not be totally respons responsible, but let me tell you what just comes to my mind now. There is one continuing what theme, armature, there's one continuity throughout all of these reinventions, relinquishings, mm -hmm. uh, all that. And that is keeping uh, 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 the, the, so many f connections with people, no matter what role I was in, I was accumulating over time one thing that was continuous, my connectivity with friends and colleagues and groups. Because leaving my family made me very lonely and anxious. And I went through the reason I spent six and a half years on a couch, God forbid. I mean, that's the reality. That's the truth. Uh, I felt about my analysis six and a half years. Uh, the same way I felt about being a university administrator, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. I would not want to do it again. So it, it, what I've learned from your questioning is that the one what link, the one thing that connects everything is my connection with other people. Because being lonely made, why did I get into groups? Well, there were mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. It was because obviously I was trying to make up for the group that I was the, 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 trying to make up for the uh, aloneness and the anxiety of my aloneness that I felt that caused me. Was any, and well, that's only one reason. Uh, and the other more, let's just say, zeitgeist or cultural reason is because of what happened uh, during, during, uh, during World War II and the, and the, and the fact that organizations like nation states would give rise to the Hitlers and to the Maos and to the Stalins and were millions and millions, and not just of Jews in the Holocaust, but of gypsies and of, 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 uh, of Jehovah's Witnesses and of, of homosexuals and of mm -hmm. many Catholics. So what I'm getting at when I saw the destruction that human institutions and groups could do that also was a, a cultural factor, but a psychological factor was the fact I, I needed so much to recreate the families, the family that I once abandoned myself, once orphaned myself from. So I think those are like what you made me realize was that throughout, and I really would think that if I would look back on my career with, as I do, feeling really at this point of my life, at the age of 85, I think and I'm not, it's only recently that I really have felt content and acknowledged and, and really what I feel most of all, I feel I have so many, I feel beloved by so many friends like yourself. And so that's the link of all of these reinventions and all the relinquishing. It seems to me I've really understood this in our conversation for the first time. That well, that I think it's, it's accounted for whatever success I've, I've had in my career is because of my capacity to need and connect and be as generous as I can with the generosity that I've received. Well, that mentors and friends, as you may recall, was one of the themes that I wanted to get to. And maybe uh, you have covered that, so that, but I might come back to that. But let me go on because I want to leave time for questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. But another theme coursing through this book is the, the pair of surprise and luck and the role of surprises and the yeah. role of luck. Now, I, you, I'm sure, know better than anyone else that Seneca, the Roman philosopher and mm. uh, playwright, supposedly said, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Mm. Have you considered that what you describe as good luck occurred because through these many reinventions you were preparing yourself consciously or unconsciously for the next challenge. 
-hmm. And if true. so, can you describe that process for us? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I can, but I'll try. I think luck is, a, you know, often when people say, well, you know, it's lucky, it sounds like, you know, rubbish. They're, they're just trying to, it's a kind of a false modesty. Now, I, I think uh, there's something about, there is something called, something like, um, you, you lived, you were there at a certain period of time. Now, then you have to ask yourself, well, well, wait a minute, Warren, you put yourself there at a certain period of time. So what is, so as Ben Hogan, the famous golfer, once famously said, you know, um, the more I practice, the luckier I get, you know, mm -hmm. all that. Mm -hmm. so, so, so luck is a tricky word, but I do think that, that I was lucky in, in, because I was always searching, and the more I searched, the more the the, lot, the, what, the bigger the pool of possibilities. I ended up re recruiting the, about the best mentor I could possibly get. And that's Doug McGregor. I ended up being at the elbow of the intellectual ferment in post World War II uh, life. That is the period between 45, let's say, and I would date it arbitrarily till 63 at the assassination of. John F. Kennedy, that there was such a mood of optimism that we really, by God, could change the world, Gene. And, and your, your deceased husband, of my friend Hal Levitt, he, he was part of this group of people who really had, call it hubris, call it whatever, but there are tears now. I'm tearing up because I know that we all were, you know, kind of like uh, the shadow of Hitler, and we were genuinely, honestly, without, and naively perhaps, thinking that if we could change the nature of human institutions, when we weren't sure about changing character, we weren't sure about, you know, even though I mentioned psychoanalysis sort of half-jokingly before, I, I'm less and less, and Freud also was very, very, although he's been, I think, uh, overly uh, bashed uh, and, and needless. So Freud never thought that psychoanalysis was a cure. He thought at best, these are Freud's words, they heightened our intellectual defenses. But I don't think that's true, at, at best. So, but we did think we could make an impact on relationships. We did think we could make an impact on helping develop healthy organizations where, and to use Lincoln's words, the better angels of ourselves could come through. We really did believe that if we could make an impact on our human institutions, we could avoid or somehow not produce those Hitlers and Stalins and Mao and uh, the, the kind of evil that does it still exist in our world. I and think now, you, you're really uh, saving me the, um, the difficulty of asking you questions, because that was one of the things I wanted to talk about, because it connects to a, a, another pair of themes of your desire to be at the center of exciting events, to wrestle with big ideas, and to do so with optimism and hope for the future. All of that encased in what I see as profound intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, the historical moment. I think, in which each of us happens to live or come to adulthood is so important. Sidney Hook wrote about this in The Hero in History, how at a certain moment in time, certain qualities are called for. Mm -hmm. And uh, and at that moment in the post-war, post-World War II environment, particularly at MIT, I think, there mm -hmm. was, and you describe it, fantastically, the excitement of the possibility of discovering something about human nature and groups and institutions that will make, that would make it possible for us to prevent another Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And that you go on, that's, that's one place and one moment in history where you do that where you are involved in a milieu that's exciting, that with big ideas, you talk about big ideas a lot mm -hmm. in the book. Mm -hmm. And I think that 
that you had other times in your life that I would like you to talk about too, where you felt you were engaged in the possibility of wrestling with new and big ideas, such as Bethel, and then later on when you were in Sausalito and you picked and chose certain friends and environments where you could do that. Could you mm -hmm. elaborate on that, please? A little bit. I think the, you're, you're focusing on the part of me which is basically a seeker, a seeker uh, always needing to comprehend. I guess if I were to talk about some drivers in me, it would be the, the, uh, comprehend. I needed to comprehend, partly out of vigilance, partly because I didn't want to I wanted to keep my eyes wide open to those eventualities that could occur and surprise you. And I, I guess maybe when I say still surprised, I, I did not want to be surprised by by somehow uh, my vigil. My I think when people say to me or ask me sometimes, "How did you get develop empathy?" I think it's out of fear. I think I was so vigilant as a youngster about danger, about being frightened, about hearing Hitler's voice over shortwave radio and the whooshing of the crowds in admiration and adoration of this uh, dictator. So I think that I, s I kept seeking out ideas and people and trying to comprehend. I guess my other big driver is bonding. If you, if you looked at me, if, you, if I were to self-examine myself in terms of evolutionary biology or evolutionary psychology, I think the two basic, if I could, uh, genetic or by genetic constraints would be uh, comprehending and bonding. Um, hmm. Not so much acquisition, which is another big dr driver, or, uh, yeah, but enough ambition, but I, uh, but, so those are the, so I was driven, but the, uh, what, what, let's see, I'm kind of gasping a little bit for breath and to try to understand myself a little bit more, but the, uh, again, the, the um, sort of going in so many directions by the questions you're asking. And by well, you know what, I am getting signals from our, yeah. our keepers at the other end that we need <laughs> to let the audience in I, on this discussion. I hope somebody in the audience will ask you oh. about the impact on you of the various crises that you face okay, and okay. what that means for leadership. Okay, but one let last, me, okay. Well, one last thing to say. Well, Jean, let me just add one more thing because I knew it was something I need to say before we hear the questions. I wanted not just to be an observer, though. And, you know, um, how do I put this? It was once said about reporters, journalists, lo, lo, they stand at the elbow of history taking down little initials. I did not want to be a person of <laughs> That's I wonderful. Wanted, I wanted to be in the arena and to understand enough of what was, it's that, that conflict or that really the good combination of both wanting to be a, an engaged observer and, and to be involved with not just taking down middle initials. Anyway, I'm sorry, I went over my time and you're right, we should open it up. Okay, let me see if, and I, as I said, I hope somebody will, some uh, person in the audience will ask you about crises because that is a major theme in your life and in the book, and I think it's, it's very revealing. But let me turn to a question from Catherine at KI Thoughtbridge. Do you think that the best leaders learn to sacrifice ego in service to something larger than selves? It seems as though you must die to self in order to be, be reborn a very spiritual notion of leadership. Would, would you repeat that, just that last sentence in Catherine's question? Okay. The last, the last it part. sounds as though you must die to self in order to be reborn a very, mm. and then I think she means that this is a rather spiritual notion of leadership. Yeah, well that's a profound question and it reminds me of one of my, I wouldn't say 
direct mentors, but someone I always admired and still do, and that's Max Dupree, Jean, whom mm -hmm. we both know, and yes. was the, really the, uh, the founder of, of uh, Herman Miller uh, Furniture. But he once said, good leaders have to abandon their ego to the talents of others. I think that's close to Catherine's question. And Max, being a spiritual, I think more spiritual than I myself feel I am, uh, I think, but I don't think I would go as far, Max, nor would Max, I think, I don't think I have to die to, to create a new self. I think yeah. I can, can contain and not kill off those other selves. No. I want to, if anything, add them. Yes. That, that, yeah. That's why I have a deep fear of being, of being, what's the word, slotted, of being, oh, categorized. Now, you know, we all want to categorize our others and ourselves, but I, I fear, I, I go out of my way not to be categorized, politically speaking, even from a religious point of view. I don't want anyone to slot me. And so, therefore, to say I'm killing off or that other self is dead, no. I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay, here's another question from Coldip in the UK. Uh, he's asking, in, on becoming a leader, you emphasize that, and he's quoting you, all leaders have the capacity to create a compelling vision, mm -hmm. one that takes people to a new place and then to translate that vision into reality. Mm -hmm. Considering the many leadership failures of strategic vision in organizations across all sectors around the world. What are your thoughts, Warren, on how leaders should create and deliver strategic visions that are good for all? Now that's what I call a small question, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a marvelous question. You know, it's very complicated, but I'm going to make it short because I, I, I want to get as many people uh, list, listening to this as we can in. Okay, first of all, no vision. Yes, it is true, Old Testament, without vision, without vision, the people perish. Okay, the point is that what is a vision, really? Uh, what is a, uh, that set of beliefs that enough, that the people in the organization can get aligned with, but at, at a deep level, I want to give you an example of this in a minute, but the, whatever, however one defines vision or strategic long-range plan, they are temporary, all of them, and they have to be completely, the idea of, let's, we have a long-range committee planning it on my, my university right now. Well, in a way, that's kind of a stupid, in a way, I can put it down. There's no such thing as a long-range plan. There is, yes, you say, what do we think we're going to, what do we want to be like five years from now? But we've got to keep redoing, resetting every single, you know, three months, every quarter, because things are moving at that pace, Gene, and that rate. So the idea of a static vision is stupid. There's no such thing. It's got to be continually Almost, I would say, at a, almost at a weekly basis, we've got to keep looking at those unexpected, those disruptive inflection points, to, to quote Clay Christensen, okay? So number one is, you know, there is no th nothing I, in this world right now, unless one's get, getting into areas of, and Gene, you're the, you've known a lot more, in fact, I know you're spending time thinking about belief systems and etc. So there are, I suppose, from a spiritual point of view, a set of religious doctrines that might, for people, for individuals, last for their lifetime and for their children's lifetime. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about secular institutions and what we usually mean by vision there and so forth. And there, I don't think they are anything more than things that have to be continually adjusted and readjusted. The other thing is, what is a deep organizational vision. And here I think we got to really drill down deeply because if you think you're in the business of let's say running an airline, you got to think more, or you think you're in the business of selling apparel, like a marvelously gifted a salesperson at an Armani store that, uh, that my wife and I were, Grace and I were shopping not long ago, 
where it was clear that she wasn't selling an Armani suit. She was selling self-esteem. That's what I call a vision for the organization. The understanding. Last night I had dinner with an event organizer. What events does she organize, Jean? She organizes weddings. That's, she's not an event organizer. She is actually creating an event that should be a reflection of the future lifestyle of that couple. She is not in the business of just setting tables and getting a cake. <laughs> she's in the Good point. real. And what most leaders don't get is what's un underneath what they're, you know, the, the, you know, we're not just making tires here. We're not just uh, in education. What are we doing? What we're really doing is not just preparing people for an occupation. That's because the occupation is going to be different or unknown five years from now. What we're doing, whether we realize it or not, is, is devoting our time to helping people continue to learn how to learn, period. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But does any, do you know of any university which has that as their main mission? They talk about all oh, great leaders, blah, blah, blah. But down deep, leaders have got to understand what it is that they really, what is the vision that that is the subtext of what they think they're doing. Because this organizer of an event like weddings, I hadn't, she really thinks about table settings. And why not? And she thinks about who's going to cater it. And who's going to do, what kind of music do they want? But does she think about that she's really creating an event, an experience, which is going to be a portrait of, of their lifestyle and of, of their, their future. Uh, of their future, exactly. And when I said this to her, she went, oh my God, she's a good friend, by the way. I don't mean to put her down at all. She, she, but I think she said, she took a pad out and began writing things down. I mean, she, <laughs> you know, that's okay. That's Okay. Uh, I'm cognizant of the time, so let me ask you a few more questions that came from the audience. Mm -hmm. From Dion at James Cook University, uh, J uh, Dion is asking, do you associate crisis with victory? I don't, I, I, Jean, you know more about this than I do, frankly, but I'll give you a quick answer. No. <laughs> okay. <Because> crisis could <laughs> Crisis could lead to opportunity. Crisis could also lead to disaster. Crisis sometimes means, you know, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> other, times, other times it could mean, you know, the, the cliche, what, what is a cliche about crisis? It's an opportunity more than anything else. Well, a risk and opportunity. Yeah, right. There you go. So I would say, you know, not necessarily. It depends on, and this is where, I must say, you are a lot more thinking than I have. That's not false modesty. Uh, you might answer that question better than I. I mean that. Well, let me turn to another question that is on crisis from Eileen at the Vanguard Group, but she's taking it. Uh, she's coming at it from a different angle. She's okay. asking you, how has personal crisis? served as both an educator and a motivator in your life and your work? Okay. Oh, I love that question, too. Well, first of all, in my book, I do refer to these as crucibles. And crucible is a good word. It's a good Christian word, meaning a moment. It's more than a defining moment, because we have crucibles throughout our lifetime. And they are, crucibles are a, a, a test of your character. They're like a crisis. They, they, now, there are two kinds. We make, I have to make a distinction between those crucibles or crises that happen to you and those crucibles you choose. Well, I chose, and when I go back and look at the crucibles in my own life, which basically is the, is the format, is, is the armature of, of my book, it's different, whatever I call them there. My last chapter, by the way, is called The Crucible of Age which is what I'm going through right now. So we always have crucibles that are testing periods in for, for how we deal with life, whether we're going to become detached, morbid, gloomy, uh, depressed, withdrawn, or whether we said, oh my God, what? Or whether it can cause 
an embracing, a robust embracing of life, and a, a kind of a, an attitude which will make you bigger, really. And, and again, quoting Lincoln, bring out our better angels. So what I'm getting at, there is a difference between diving into a dangerous place or being pushed into a dangerous place. So that's one important distinction. And I think to be, to, to uh, at those moments where you feel you're really going through like aging, let's take it, which I'm uh, going to go through for, I hope, a long time. <laughs> but it is, <laughs> but I find that aging is the, is the most interesting, the most, is the scariest, is the, is the most, in some ways, rewarding, and in, in other words, debilitating when, you know, because my, my body keeps giving me signals that I can't walk the way I used to walk. You know, my body's giving me signals, you know, so there's a whole lot of things that I really, for example, but, you know, when you think about the, the adventure of aging and you realize how significant friendship is, how significant, let's not call it a support group, let's call it people you can turn to, you're, you're a, people who are watching your back and you can depend on, that they will talk truthfully to you. Uh, honestly to you that you can depend on oh my god y you know it, you might we may die alone and but we certainly we don't age alone and for example one of the things about learning about crystals is what what will help you th through these periods well for me being very much a social animal I'm not as you know a person who thinks I mean, my all my learning is dialogic I wanted to call my book originally Not Still Surprised, which and I love, but I must say, I never wanted anybody to give me feedback on that because I just love this title too much. <laughs> I don't want to hear feedback. But I, for a while I thought I'd call it uh, Myself Through Others because truly, just as in our conversation today, you gave me, you know, when you talk about all the the inventions and relinquishings and reinventing, but there is one little, you know, coming out that won't, one thing is connecting the dots. And that's my need for friendship, my need for developing people that I wanted, needed, and people who needed and wanted me. You gave well, me that link. So, you know, um, I, I think what I'm getting at is for each crucible in our life, uh, we've got to figure out, well, what kind of help do we need to go through this? There are people I know who are listening to this program who've gone through incredibly more significant uh, crucibles than I have in my life, and yet they pull through them, learn how to overcome them, and in some cases to actually go through a lot of redemption to re regain the stature that they had lost during a period of their life. We are now one minute from the end of, of this webinar. Uh, Ashley, I think we really have to have a, a sequel to this because I only got to ask <laughs> three out of, out of 13 questions I had prepared. But Warren, I have to ask you one crucial question. Do you still play the accordion? <laughs> No, but I'm thinking about playing the recorder. You know that nice old medieval. Yes, Warren. I have to tell the audience in the book. Warren talks <laughs> about his anguish as a little boy uh, of having to get on the school bus, dragging his accordion uh, for his music lesson at school. But mm. that was a facetious question. But thank you, Warren. Oh, uh, thank you, early in Still Surprised, you write and I'm quoting, the writer tries to deliver an honest, evocative version of his or her life or an important part of it. The best memoirists are good companions, entertaining you as long as their books are in your hand. And that's the end of the quote. I want to thank you for living up to your promise and going beyond by giving your readers the gift of thinking about and fingering the wise, provocative, and deeply touching revelations mm. about yourself and about leadership in still surprise. <laughs> so I urge everyone in the audience to read it. You will be mm. totally entranced. Gee. Thank you, Warren. <laughs> Thank you, audience, for your good questions. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, everyone who's been associated with this. Mm.
And with that, our webinar is complete. I'd like to very quickly announce the winners of our Still Surprised book giveaway. They are Natasha of Texas Christian University, Robert of Fisher Collaborative Services, Nicolette of Hertz, and Brennan of Rochester Institute of Technology. Thank you one and all.